Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and State Farm. This time on Motor Week 89, we search for the meaning of Ferrari. We visit Marinello, Italy, home of the Ferrari factory and Fiorano test track. We try the fabulous F40 at Fiorano and show why we say fabulous. Plus, Pat Goss, Lisa Barrow, and Craig Singhaas explore the Ferrari experience in America. So come drive with us next. Motor Week 89, television's automotive magazine, with your host, John Davis. Hello and welcome again to Motor Week 89. We're glad to have you with us. Enzo Ferrari, father of Italy's most celebrated sports cars, died on August 14, 1988. He was 90. But his legacy lives on. Just mentioning the name Ferrari makes the palms sweat and the pulse race. Our entire show this time is dedicated to the feeling that is Ferrari and to the man responsible for it. In the next half hour, we're going to search for the source of that feeling, and the only natural place to begin our quest is in Italy. Ah, Italia. The sights, the sounds, the cars, the red cars. Italy is the land of passion, and nowhere is that passion more evident than in the cars of Ferrari. The north of Italy is where many a sports car fan will tell you lies heaven. Marinello is the home of Il Cavallino, the prancing horse. This quiet town of 20,000, far from the urban madness of Rome or Milan, is the breeding ground for Italy's most famous thoroughbreds. At first glance, it is a factory like any other, except for that special name emblazoned on the walls. Contrary to legend, not everything here is done by hand. American computers drive sophisticated Italian machine tools for engine milling. From grinding to drilling, engine components move on a state-of-the-art conveyance system. And microprocessors control rust protection chemicals that are too dangerous to be applied by man. But automation makes Ferraris better cars, not better Ferraris. Any Ferrari car, I think that uh, you can find uh, the, the spirit of the factory that is a sporting spirit. What is this spirit? How does it set this car factory apart from others? Look behind the modern trappings and you'll begin to see. Nowhere in all the high volume, mega profit factories of Japan will you find men doing this. Ferrari cast engine blocks in the same way that it did 40 years ago. Even the alloys are mixed in small batches on the foundry floor. The composition of a Ferrari engine block is too important to be left to outsiders or computers. Handwork is everywhere, and it's part of what makes a Ferrari a Ferrari. If you want, every part, every piece, every element of the interior of the car can be hand-fitted all in the finest Connolly leather, in virtually any color. In the auto industry, this level of handwork indicates either poverty or pride. Poverty has not been a problem since corporate giant Fiat bought half of Ferrari in 1969. While money has only been plentiful for about half the company's life, pride has always been in abundance. After all, would a machine care that there is the tiniest imperfection in a door panel and have the skill to tap it out without disturbing nine coats of carefully applied paint? We think not. Pride is the key to the Ferrari magic. Pride born out of one of the most illustrious histories in the automotive world. That history is well illustrated by the lobby of the Marinello factory. Here reside the cars that Ferrari considers major stepping stones in the Marx legend. There is the 12-cylinder 125C, the first true Ferrari, the first to wear the prancing horse. 
It was also the first true Ferrari to race, making its competition debut on May 11, 1947. From then on, the name Ferrari became synonymous with motorsports. Few who saw the 125C's debut realized the greatness that was to follow. Next to the 125C sits one of the first Ferrari Formula 2 race cars, designated the 166 F2. This is the type of car that most exemplifies the spirit of Ferrari. Throughout his life, Enzo Ferrari made no secret of the fact that his road cars were Corseolo, racing derived. He built them solely to pay for the Ferrari racing program. Racing was Ferrari's all-consuming passion, and it is a tribute to Ferrari the man that he could recognize his own limitations. Others drove the precious cars that he could well have driven himself. While road cars may not have been Ferrari's number one priority, they did not lack for his inspiration. This is driven home by the final car in the Marinello lobby, the F40. The final car to receive Mr. Ferrari's approval, built by his engineers as a tribute to mark his 90th birthday and the company's 40th anniversary. The F40 is pure Ferrari, as modern as the space shuttle, yet rigidly traditional, much like Enzo Ferrari himself. It is the end of an era, but hardly the last of its line. As the workers of Ferrari assemble the ultra-modern F40, they continue the tradition. Older teaches younger, as it was done 40 years ago, or 400. Only now the materials are Kevlar and carbon fiber, where once there was only steel. Yet the meticulous handwork and attention to detail remains. When the workday ends, Ferrari workers may leave the factory, but they do not leave Ferrari at the factory gate. Across the street from the Marinello plant stands the Ristorante Il Cavallino. This four-star establishment was a favorite dining spot for Enzo Ferrari. He even had his own dining room. The trophies of Ferrari wins in the famed Mille Miglia rally are kept at Il Cavallino. The restaurant has become a place of pilgrimage for the automotive community, each group contributing its logo to a special door as a memento of its visit. This devotion is not restricted to Marinello. A short drive away in Modena is another restaurant that doubles as a shrine. On the street where Enzo Ferrari lived is the Trattoria Lauro. Though not as fancy as Il Cavallino, its decor shows just as much pride in Italy's most famous automobiles. The walls are covered with pictures of all the great Ferrari drivers and the machines that carried them to victory. Much space is also devoted to the great road cars that are the envy of drivers the world over. No matter where you look, Ferrari is on everything. Everything. It's not surprising that Mr. Ferrari ranks close to the Pope in the hearts of the Italian people. To the people on the factory floor at Marinello, however, he is even more. For they are all part of a greater whole, of which Enzo Ferrari is still the most important aspect. They are the hands that shape Il Commendatore's dreams, as integral to the process of creating a Ferrari as the first flash of inspiration in a great man's mind. From those who own and love these rare cars, even for Ferraristi, the cars demand special qualities. More than uh, any other things, uh, uh, you must be fond, you must be in love with uh, the speed, with the uh, success, with the competition, with the sporting field uh, that Ferrari uh, so well has represented in, uh, this, uh, in the last 40 years of the story of the automobile. And as we have found out, it takes a rarer and even more special person to build a Ferrari. In our search so far, we found that part of what makes a Ferrari is the way it's built and the people who build it. This craftsmanship and pride can be traced back to the spirit of the Italian Renaissance. You could say the Renaissance lives on in Ferrari cars. Mr. Ferrari's passion for racing also lives on, as well as the Italian national passion for speed. These things are Ferrari. And what better way to experience them than by driving the newest Ferrari? the last Ferrari to debut under Mr. Ferrari's direction, the F40. Forget the Testarossa. Forget the GTO. Leave the 328s to the streets of Southern California. This is the Ferrari of the hour. 
This is the F40. To call it Ferrari's fastest production model is an injustice. This car makes Ferrari red that much redder. This car's pinup poster will decorate boys' bedrooms for years to come. This car produces sensations that our videotape can't begin to reproduce. This F40 is a race car for the street, a true Corsaiolo. The chassis is made of steel tubing and plastic. The body is Kevlar and carbon fiber, hardly what we'd call production car construction. And the F40's interior is not the sort of place where you'd want to be during a traffic jam. There's not a radio to be found, let alone a trip computer or the soft, frilly trappings we've come to expect in Gran Turismo GT cars. The F40 is for one thing only, hard driving, be it on the street or on the track. And everything, including these carbon fiber seats, is up to that task. The typical Ferrari gated shifter is the only interior bright work. On the prototype we saw, there wasn't even a trim panel for the door, just a cable handle and enough carbon fiber for structural integrity. The dash has the simple job of holding the instruments where the driver can see them. Immediately ahead, the driver is burdened by as few instruments as possible. Secondary gauges are out of direct view, as are the vents for the less than state-of-the-art ventilation system. Yet nothing is here that shouldn't be. Even the clutch, brake, and accelerator pedals are finely machined works of weight savings. And in that spirit, this lightweight plastic racing window is optional. This F40 is a European version. The 180 or so examples that make it to the States will be slightly different in detail. There may be a few more comforts, but not many. That would spoil the car. For those who drive the minimalist F40 for a long distance on the highway, there's special F40 luggage that's designed to fit in the few spots where there's unused space. The F40 is most at home on the racetrack, or at least an open, very open road. And what better place to try it than Ferrari's own Fiorano test track? This is where the new Super Ferrari surprised us most. As in most race-bred cars, the controls are heavy to the touch. You'll need a good strong left leg for pushing the clutch pedal. Aside from that, the F40 has few other vices. It can be driven close to the edge of its capabilities without superhuman capabilities from its driver. But going fast around corners isn't the only thing the F40 does well. Power comes from a 3-liter V8. It's a further development of the engine used in Ferrari's GTO. It has all the things you'd expect in today's high-performance engines. Four valves per cylinder, four cams, and twin turbos with intercoolers. Output is 471 horsepower. Enough said. Zero to 100 kilometers per hour, that's about 62 miles per hour, takes a short 4.1 seconds. Getting to the end of one kilometer, that's just over six-tenths of a mile, takes 20.9 seconds. And by then, the F40 is running at 166 miles per hour. Top speed, according to the factory, is 201 miles per hour. As for stopping, we didn't have the opportunity for our usual brake test. But rest assured, the F40s is pretty adept at using friction to turn speed into harmless heat. For that, there are brake rotors as large as some car's wheels, 13 inches. One behind each of the F40's 17 inch wheels. And there's no power assist. The F40 doesn't need it. Getting the brakes to work doesn't take nearly as much leg muscle as the clutch pedal. Good thing. The brakes in this car work so well, stops at high speed could be delayed for much longer than we'd thought. After the Fiorano drive, Ferrari let us take the F40 out to see how it looked among the Apennine Mountains above Maranello. It looked, well, at home. The F40 is just hospitable enough to be a road-going car, much to the surprise of some Maranello cyclists. The F40 on the street is an experience not many will forget. If you want an F40 for your own country motoring, the privilege will cost you about $260,000. And unlike the super exotics from some other makers, this one will be sold in the U.S. Problem is, every one has been spoken for. In fact, Ferrari of North America has had more orders than the factory can begin to fill. In the end, the F40 is something we will only drive in our dreams. But what sweet dreams they will be.
Origins of the Ferrari Legend is a history of the early years of Ferrari. It is superbly told by Joaquino Colombo, the designer of the first Ferrari V12 engine. Mr. Colombo provides a surprisingly unbiased history of the post-war origins of Ferrari. Much credit is given to the early, now almost forgotten Ferrari drivers, as well as Il Commendatore himself. Colombo illustrates his history with many never-before-seen photos of those early years. An eye-opening look at one of the world's truly great marks. Ferrari ownership makes you a member of a fairly exclusive club. After all, not everyone can afford one. Still, the price of entry doesn't have to be $260,000. You may find a used Ferrari for much less. As with buying any used car, there are pitfalls. Lisa Barrow is here with some advice on how to avoid them. So you think you might like to buy a used Ferrari, but you're not sure how to go about it. A good place to start is a Ferrari dealership. Take a walk around the car and look at its condition. Watch for chips in the paint or tears in the upholstery. And keep in mind that aftermarket wheels and steering wheels could destroy the value of the car. So once you've decided you like the car, take it for a test drive. You want to make sure that the steering is uh, nice and tight and the car is not moving from side to side. You want to make sure that the gears are shifting cleanly and crisply. A grinding noise could indicate a problem with the gearbox and gearboxes are very expensive to fix. The whole engine has to come out and repairs could cost up to $5,000. Then, you might want to take a look at the service record on the Ferrari you're interested in. Ferraris are maintenance sensitive automobiles and for the protection you'd want to know that the car has had the regular services as provided in the Ferrari maintenance book. To give you a better idea of how the previous owner treated the car, put it up on a lift and check underneath. So we want to check mainly for the engine oil drain and the transmission oil sump, any leaks in this area, any leaks in the clutch housing or the input shaft area, and any leaks in the oil cooler area. Under here we'll see that the pan is not damaged. Any damage in this area could cause gear transfer linkage problems. Also when you're looking to buy a used Ferrari, check to see if it's a gray market car. A placard on the driver's post will indicate if the car was made to comply with U.S. standards at the Ferrari factory. If the car was converted, ask for its Department of Transportation papers. The EPA can verify its authenticity. Used Ferraris can range anywhere from the low 20s on up. So if you're one of the lucky ones who can afford to buy a Ferrari, make sure you look with your head and not just with your heart. Suppose you've become a member of that exclusive club of Ferrari owners and already know firsthand what makes a Ferrari special. And now you have to care for the car. Well, Pat Goss is here to talk about a problem that many Ferrari owners face. Pat? Most Ferrari owners end up storing their cars for long periods, John. Trouble with that is a few months in a warm garage can do more damage to a Ferrari than 24 hours of endurance racing. Well, what can you do if you own a Ferrari and you have to store it for a period of time? Well, it's really pretty simple. The first thing that you want to do is have the coolant in the cooling system changed. But this is definitely not a do-it-yourself operation. You want to take it to a qualified Ferrari technician and have it done. Now, the reason for that is there's about a mile of plumbing underneath a Ferrari. And there are several points where the cooling system has to be bled to get all of the air out of it. So you want somebody to do it that knows what they're doing. Okay, first thing. Now, you got the car into the garage where you're going to store it. The thing that you want to do there is you want to change the engine oil and the oil filter. You want clean, fresh oil in it. And the reason for that is very simple. Even relatively new oil will have some acid in it if the car has been run. This is a natural byproduct of combustion. Well, if you store the car in a state of disuse, this acid can attack some of the metal parts inside the engine, like bearings and so on, and it can do long-term damage. So you want fresh oil and a fresh filter on it. Next thing, you want to change the gear oil in the transmission, in the gearbox. You want to have fresh oil in there before you store it. And next, this one is pretty simple. 
You want to make sure that the fuel system is full. You want the tank full, and then you want to add a fuel stabilizer to it. Now what this does is it keeps the fuel from deteriorating. It keeps it from building gum and varnish in the system. You know, this can help prevent problems in the fuel injection or in the carburetor, whichever system you happen to have. Now why this is really important, suppose you have a carbureted car and the float valve in the carburetor sticks as a result of, of varnish buildup or something from not stabilizing the fuel. Okay, you go to start the car, raw fuel runs into the engine into one of the cylinders. Well, this can cause what is known as a hydrostatic lock. And this hydrostatic lock can do serious damage to the inside of the engine when you try to start it. So, use a fuel stabilizer. Now, I have to tell you one thing, though. Both Ferrari and Bosch, Bosch makes the fuel injection systems for these cars, neither one of them have tested these fuel stabilizers. So, they have reservations about using them. So, you have to be the judge on that but I would recommend that you do. All right, next, back to the engine itself. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to pull all of the spark plugs out of the engine, and then we're going to put about one tablespoon of oil in each one of the cylinders. Now, what we're doing here is we're getting the, the cylinders lubricated in the upper portions. After we put the oil in, we want to crank the engine over several times to get any excess oil out of the cylinders and to spread this oil around inside the cylinders. Now again, we don't want any excess in there because of the hydrostatic lock. We get too much in there and we put the spark plug back in and we try to crank it. Again, serious engine damage. Next one, real simple. Take the battery out of the car. Put it in a secure spot. Buy an automatic trickle charger. An automatic one so it'll cut back as the battery becomes fully charged. Okay, you put it on the trickle charger. You can just let it sit there indefinitely. Now what this does is it keeps the battery from going dead, keeps it from destroying itself while it's being stored. It also protects the electrical system of the car. Okay, next, and this one is really simple. You need four good quality jack stands. You need to jack the car up and position it on the jack stand so the car is actually sitting on these stands. You want the tires off of the, off of the floor. There are two reasons for this. Number one, if the tires sit on the floor for an extended period of time, they can actually develop flat spots that will destroy them. We certainly don't want that to happen. The second thing is, no matter how secure your garage is, there are rodents that can get into it, and they would dearly love to make a nest in your gorgeous Ferrari leather seats, and we certainly don't want that to happen. Now, these are the steps that you can take to, well, store your Ferrari or any other car for that matter and minimize the possibility of any damage during that storage. Now, if you happen to have a question about your Ferrari or maybe even something that is a little less than a Ferrari, I'd love to hear from you. And if I select your letter to be answered, well, I'll send you a MotorWeek t-shirt. Now, the address is MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. With the passing of Enzo Ferrari come questions about the future of the company and its products. So here's Lisa Barrow with all the latest Ferrari motor news. Lisa? Thanks, John. Enzo Ferrari's death has left a great void at Ferrari, but it looks as though his passing will cause no great change in company direction. Fiat has purchased an additional 40% of Ferrari stock, so it now holds 90%. But Fiat already had day-to-day -day control of Ferrari passenger car production. All that's changed is the amount of stock that Fiat owns. Even though the giant automaker runs the smaller company, there's still a Ferrari in a key company position. Piero Lardi Ferrari, Enzo Ferrari's son, will continue as vice president in charge of passenger car production. He also holds the remaining 10% of company stock. As far as new products are concerned, Ferrari is about to introduce this new model. It's the replacement for the current 328. Called the 348, it will have a 4-liter V8 engine with 4 valves per cylinder. While the 348 is loosely based on its predecessor, it will be much lighter and faster. Performance will be much closer to that of the current Ferrari Testarossa. The 348 is scheduled for a 1989 debut at the Frankfurt Motor Show. John? 
Thanks, Lisa. From a Ferrari of the future, we turn to Ferraris of the past. For many Federisti, the older cars hold the greatest fascination and the highest prices. Craig Singhaus has gone out in search of three of the most coveted Ferraris to find out what makes them so special. Whenever you come to a gathering of Ferrari aficionados, you're bound to see some of the most significant automobiles of all time. Automobiles of undeniable grace and beauty. But even among such lofty peers, there are a few that stand apart even in this prestigious crowd. Milestone designs, such as Lee Ryan's Berlinetta Lusso 250 GTL, a classic V12 Ferrari. The car is designed by Benefrina. The body was actually built by Scaetti in Italy on a Ferrari chassis. The automobile has influenced many major manufacturers' designs. For Kirk White, owning his Ferrari is doubly significant. The automobile is a 1971 Ferrari 365 GTB4 Daytona, V12, four cams, six twin choke Weber's, 4.4 liters, 172 mile an hour top speed, last of the great front engine Ferraris. This particular car is significant in that it won the Cannonball Baker across the country race, the very first one with Dan Gurney and Brock Yates in a time of 35 hours and 54 minutes, which is pretty phenomenal. The flagship of Ron Spangler's collection is no less phenomenal. This is a 1967 275 GTB. Uh, there were some less than 500 cars made, about 475 to be exact. There were a few of them made in solid alloy, but most of the cars were steel with alloy hoods, decks, and doors. It is considered by many to be the pinnacle of the Ferrari construction during the time that Enzo Ferrari was directly involved in, in helping design and construct his cars in the pre-Fiat days of 1969. The cars have doubled and tripled in value in the past 12 months, and a good example of this car now would sell somewhere in the range of $350,000 to $400,000. But it isn't really the investment potential that attracts most owners to the mark of the prancing horse. The faithful will admit that it's simply the sheer erotic thrill that goes with owning a Ferrari. We all can't own Ferraris, but we can appreciate them. That's half the fun. We hope you've enjoyed our excursion into the legend and reality of Ferrari. I'm John Davis. For Pat Goss, Craig Singhaus, and Lisa Barrow, we'll see you next time. If you'd like a transcript of this program, send $4 to MotorWeek Transcripts, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Residents of Maryland at 20 cents sales tax. Ask for show number 809. MotorWeek is a production of Maryland Public Television. Thank <laughs> you.